so we are now on target please take over thank you so much sure. sorry for thank the inconvenience you. no no it's, yeah. it's, i'm i'm like good evening everyone i'm extremely sorry for the inconvenience i actually used another laptop and it's completely screwed up so again sorry for the 15 minutes delay almost like 17 minutes delay so without wasting time what i thought like i will go over a few challenging scenarios that they are not exactly challenging one it may be very normal for some of you but for trainees who are in the mdd and bdcp of residency program or those who are the young in pathology it may be a little challenging so i always use this slide uh with a philosophical thing which i borrowed it from my mentor dr amin and used it in most of my presentations just to show like hme is not dying it is the gold standard we have to use we have to give a lot of respect to the pink and blue to give a diagnosis and utilize that maximally to help our patients and the rest all are ancillary we can live without ihc we can live without exome transcriptome next gen sequencing but we cannot live without a good hne state so from the first case uh, which is relatively young women with recent onset acute onset left flank pain in the kidney area and no other constitutional symptom no weight loss no fever nothing just a flank pain and an ultrasound was done there was about a 3 cm mass in the left renal cortex it was hyperechoic and the mass was vascular well circumscribed so this was this is the mass with the four stars or the x sign and it has some vascular it is this black area it is surrounded by vessels pretty well circumscribed so the patient was admitted as the mass was in one of the poles it was small the patient is young so the urologist thought for going for a nephron sparing nephrectomy or a partial nephrectomy and we usually get frozen section intraoperative consult for partial uh, this partial nephrectomy specimen to see the tumor is completely excised or not the margin is positive or negative the parenchymal margin and what kind of tumor they are most of the time they are very curious to know uh actually just i want to highlight one thing here which is kind of a take home message for the procedure if your parenchymal margin is positive in a uh, partial nephrectomy specimen it doesn't add any value for the further intraoperative management because positivity doesn't make it like the surgeon is going to give you more tissue like in a whipple resection suppose you are saying your margin is positive the gi surgeon is going to give you a little more pancreatic tissue but here that doesn't hold good because studies have shown which is published in european journal of virology a few years ago a positive margin versus negative margin doesn't show significant difference or any difference at all in assessing mostly we just have to look for the concavity of uh, the convexity of the mass is kind of completely excised and what is the type and if it's an oncocytoma you feel good like you're dealing with a uh low grade tumor but trust me do not i mean i this is kind of a recommendation for my fellow pathologists do not try to give a final diagnosis of the histologic type of tumor in a partial nephrectomy so what happened in this so this is the tumor uh the tumor is kind of brown tan brown with white area in the center fairly circumscribed this is the perinephric patch some kidney and some convolution a little bit of hemorrhage it doesn't really look cystic with a yellow color of a renal cell carcinoma it doesn't have a friable surface it's more smooth and glistening or shiny and it does have it doesn't have a exactly mahogany brown but it has brown and tan and brown mixed color and some amount of hemorrhage the margin was negative so usually uh with a lot of regard to my pgi training i always do a intraoperative crypt cytology in all my flows and just to save time i can do something in like 2 minutes instead of waiting for 20 minutes or having a section so i did a intraoperative cytology of that map so what we have in this picture we have this thing structure and the cells are trying to like apart the drape the structure with some cells in the center 
and it was a pretty cellular clear mm, cells are not clear that one thing you can see they are round or there are some some are spindle mostly round and they have some amount of cytoplasm i'll go to another picture and if you can see the cells are round to polyhedral to polygonal they have a little bit of eccentricity more or less round to eccentric nucleus chromatin is dense with some inclusion which has a color similar to the cytoplasmic uh, the cytoplasm here a little uh, not like a nucleoli the the nucleoli is inconspicuous i do see a group okay and this is the intraoperative frozen section slide it looks like thyroid follicles and they are the thyroid follicles are kind of lined by the cells the cells are cuboidal the density ratio is maintained with mild increase in the nuclear size maybe or with a small nucleus so what is it it was a few years ago like in 2014 or so this case so can anyone tell me some kind of diagnosis how to deal with such kind of a frozen section when the urologist is after your life to know the diagnosis He doesn't care much about the margin. Anyone? Any diagnosis so far from the intraoperative consultation? Am I audible? to no diagnosis from the house so how i dealt with this case i said the surgical margin of excision is negative for tumor there was no tumor it looks like thyroid follicle or it could be something coming from the thyroid how is the thyroid in this case carcinoid of the kidney or it is like a end stage kidney and the surgeon told me that eco texture of the kidney is normal the size is normal it is not contracted it is not granular the other kidney is normal ureac is normal and the thyroid he doesn't know but he said definitely i'm going to look into the thyroid but so far i don't have anything else to do i have taken out the complete tumor so let's work it up so on the permanent section which we, what we have we are again this thyroid follicle with some architectural distortion some outbound chicles and infolding some areas which looks like lymphocytic thyroiditis a lot of follicular destruction follicles some fibrosis in these areas the fibrotic areas the cells look small with scan cytoplasm they look atrophic and these are the areas where there is fracturing of the mm, and scalloping of the colloid so we thought probably it is something coming from the thyroid as a follicular or a follicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma because the groove and the inclusion carcinoid with prominent follicular differentiation thyroidation that you see the esrd but the esrd was out the patient is female so probably it is a stroma ovary with malignant transformation at the metastatic site but the pelvic ultrasound pathological examination everything was normal pet ct was negative thyroid scan and examination of other systems they're all within normal limit so i need help here so you guys have to speak it speak out now i seriously need help here to work up the case anyone no participation dr nadim you are on as ambed this is nandita here hi 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 dr kakkar hi dr nandita how are you the evidence should come up yeah ask the residents to come up please yeah do do we have resident we have resident and the fellows i mean the senior resident resident and the dm students please come up with i really need help here i do not know what to do if you do not speak i won't proceed please help me here what Wait, should i do there is no problem here yeah please speak out i know we have the best set of resident in our country so please speak out the pet ct was negative there was nothing else in the rest of the organ 
I'm working this cup in case in 2013-14. I had no idea what I'm doing. Thyroid scan was normal. Everything was normal. We could extract the kidneys normal. We had kidney normal. So I do not know what to do. Yes. Yeah. Please be loud. Anyone? So I thought, like, I'll go for some immunohistochemistry to know what. It, the first of all, I was not sure I'm dealing with a tumor of the kidney or I'm dealing with a tumor coming from the thyroid gland. Because sometimes what happens, there may not be anything in the thyroid, but you have an occult metastasis. So I need to know these are thyroidal in origin or the renal or metanephric in origin. So I have no idea, thinking that I put some stain. So what I did, initially I did one stain for thyroid and one stain for kidney. So for, for kidney, I do not like CD10 a lot. So I did a PAX2 and a PAX8. And for thyroid, I did TDF1. So what happened? The cells were positive for PAX2 and TTF1. Here, what, what I just learned, if I do PAX8, PAX8 is going to be positive in thyroid as well as in the kidney. So it doesn't help. So PAX2 is a better marker, and I have seen that CD10 can be positive in both the scenarios. But your, my TTF1 is dead negative. It is completely negative. Thyroglobulin was negative. It was strong, bright, positive, like a Christmas tree. Every nuclei was positive brown for PAX2. All the proximal tubular markers like CD10, RCC antigen, the neuroendocrine markers, and aftochromo 56 were negative. Ki67 was about 6-7%. It was low. It's about 5%, I would say. So, what is the diagnosis? The thyroid like follicular carcinoma of the kidney. So, let's talk about this entity. It's an extremely uncommon entity, not that common. We are, Santos must be having some cases, Dr. Nandita must be having a few cases. I have a few cases. So, the cases where you see a lot of GU uh, urology pathology, you do come across this kind of tumor. There is another variant also, which is a thyroid like follicular carcinoma is papillary like nuclear features. There is no gender predilection. It is a wide age range. They can be small, they can be big. There are two cases with seven and nine centimeter. They look like well differentiated follicle derived thyroid follicular neoplasm. And there are only a couple of cases renal uh, with regional metastasis and occasional ones with distant meds. So what are, the, what are the pathologic attributes we need to know when you work up these kind of cases? They're well circumscribed, they have a homogeneous scar surface. Because of the colloid, if I go back to my slide, which I did not say deliberately on the growth examination, it does have that, not exactly the beefy red appearance of a thyroid, but it does have a glistening thing. If you see cases of like oncocytoma, it looks uniformly, any pink tumor of the kidney, they look uniformly brown. And you have a central scar, you may not have a central scar, but you're uniformly here. What we're looking at here, if you look at by the color scheme, what Dr. Rosa used to tell us during our fellowship, you have a brown color and you have tan color. So it's nothing not. So the tan is representing something else, and the brown is representing something else on microscopy. Plus, hemorrhage is kind of rare in those big tumors like oncocytoma. So, and even historically, there's a classical positivity for the renal tubule associated markers like low molecular cytokeratin, biomentin, PAX2, and PAX8. I would say do not waste your money doing PAX8 when thyroid is a differential because thyroid is also going to be positive for PAX8 because it stains malarian, thyroid, and metanephric tumor. PAX2 is fairly specific here. Again, I'm saying it is fairly specific because nothing in immuno world is completely specific. They're negative for TTF1 and thyroglobulin. They're mostly negative for CK7, RCC, CD10, and PAX8 also sometimes. So it's kind of a plus minus thing. <laughs> So you can do one on one on one and you have the answer. And the differential again is carcinoid with prominent follicular differentiation, thyroidization of the tubule, of a chronic pyelonephritis in end stage renal disease, stroma overlay with myelin transformation at a metastatic site and our metastatic 
thyroid carcinoma. Imaging has no role here. If a, a preoperative middle core biopsy, a cell block, is can be done. Like MD Anderson people, they still do middle core biopsy for the renal tumor just to differentiate is the primary renal neoplasm a metastatic. In that time, if you have immunoid, it does help. And that actually helps in managing the patient, which has a significant management and prognostic, prognostic implications. Benign in majority cases, so partial nephrectomy is adequate. Again, margin status, I already went over. So to take home measures for this, <coughs> excuse me, I have a bad throat, but go with though, is a relatively rare and distinct neoplasm, renal tubular neoplasm, or epithelial neoplasm that should be distinguished from its malignant mimics. Overall, it has a low-grade malignant potential. It is not a benign tumor completely, but from the aggressive one, overall prognosis is favorable, recurrence and metastasis are rare, a correct diagnosis of the primary renal neoplasm and differentiate it from the metastatic tumor, which is coming from elsewhere, would help in appropriately decide what decide like what management should be taken and how to work with the patient. So any question in this case, then I'll move on to the next one. Dr. Nandita, any question? Uh, I think your resident. We are not taking interactive uh, things because mm -hmm. of uh, you know issues uh, with the time we'll and all. Go one way. We'll okay. Go one way. Cool, cool. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Okay. For the next one, I thought I would just go over a problem in urologic pathology. We all come at us. We get two RP tips. For the resident, I just want to clarify one thing: transurethral resection of prostate versus two RBT. When we are doing two RBT. We are cystoscopic. We are basically going into the bladder and plugging out, and uh, taking out the. We pluck out the bladder tumor. TURP. We are sampling the central zone of the prostate. We are going through the urethra and taking out the central zone. The way we are taking out the central zone, we are taking out the bladder neck musculature. If we have the poorly differentiated high grade tumor in the bladder neck, the sample from the bladder neck because bladder neck is sampled in TURP specimen. So what to do? Let's go over a few cases and see. So we have two cases in the left and the right. The right one looks a little paler, maybe a lot of clear cytoplasm, a little more clear cytoplasm from the right one. The right one has nesting pattern with a little stroma in between, which is inflammatory. And uh, sorry, on the left one, and the right one has some holes, the clear cytoplasm, some signature ring cells, and again, this has muscle. So the bladder neck muscle is involved in this high grade carcinoma um, and so we do not know which one is bladder and which one is prostate. Probably this clearing in this kind of hinting a little towards prostate and here this kind of a nesting or a vague urothelial nest kind of appearance hinting towards bladder but are we sure we are not. So uh, after workup the left one turned out to be a bladder and the right one turned out to be a prostate, but why we are even worried to do this? Traditionally, what happens, a bladder tumor, like in this case, this case is a pretty straightforward case. Why? We have large nest, the muscles, and the cells have a hard cell border, or we can see a lot of cytoplasm, which is pink. There's no plastic reaction. Here, the dysplasia is minimal. We have nest with clear cytoplasm and the nuclear cytoplasm ratio is maintained. So it's kind of a pretty straightforward space case to say, and it is forming a gland, a prostate versus a bladder. However, and when you get surface neoplasia, we have CIS, nest and broad shading pattern of arrangement, marked nuclear pleomorphism, a prominent cell border with glassy eosinophilic cytoplasm, what I say, hard glassy eosinophilic cytoplasm, and presence of famous differentiation. It favors the endothelial carcinoma, whereas you see asini, fibriform pattern, nest, seeds, cells, even at the highest rate, they retain their nuclear monotony with prominent conspicuous nucleoli and a pale clear to cytoplasm with crystalloid and blue mucin. It favors the prostate carcinoma, but things are not that easy in real life. This is another case from a TUR specimen, and the right side, the little one is a focus of prostatic acid adenocarcinoma deletion fork, probably with tubiforming, and this amphiphilic sort of cytoplasm, some clearing, 
nuclear monotony is maintained, whereas on the right side, the cells look ugly. That's it. They have plomorphism, they have prominent chromocenters, have chromasia, big cells. So in the case of case with coexistent UCA and PCA, urethral carcinoma and prostatic carcinoma. Again, PSA in high grade tumor, I would recommend you not to do PSA if in a focus you are thinking of a prostatic differential in a metastatic site or somewhere else, like in this location and the nuclei is really high grade, and PSA doesn't help. Again, about one third of the PSA, one third of high grade prostatic adenocarcinoma, they get highlighted by PSA. PSA is useless, rather use MK3.1. And this diagnostic difficulty is also compounded by negative PSA in the high grade tumor. Also, PSA is fairly non-specific for prostate. It tends a lot of extra prostatic organs even the in female breast. The benign structures like urethral glands, panic cells, breast endometrium, nephrogenic adenoma, cystitis glandularis, a lot of structures which are positive for PSA. And malignancy, again, a little percentage of bladder adenocarcinoma is also positive for PSA. So what to do? Why this distinction is important? Everything we do, we want to make our patient happy. So that they can get a correct diagnosis, they'll have a correct treatment, and they go home. If a TUR specimen has a high grade tumor that turns out to be urothelial carcinoma, it is at least a stage 2B tumor. And in prostate, it is a stage 3A tumor. In spite, in prostate, the phytogenia survival ranges from 81 to 900 percent. Here it is less in urothelial carcinoma. Again, the therapy, if it is in the TUR specimen, that means it is outside the premises of the prostate gland. So radical prostatectomy is not a treatment of choice. If the urologist gets, the urologist has done a TUR specimen to alleviate urinary retention symptoms. The patient came for BPH, they did a TUR, the patient went home happily. But that TUR specimen after three, four days had a cancer. If it turned out to be prostate, then radical prostatectomy is not the treatment. They will go for hormone deprivation therapy or ADT, androgen deprivation therapy. And there are also the role of CMET inhibitor, VEGF inhibitor, nesmolitinib, or anti-PSMA, and pan-AKT inhibitor. And for urothelial carcinoma treatment, here is a prostatectomy, chemotherapy, and they will probably chase after a 2 or go for an mTOR inhibitor. So they are therapeutically and prognostically different. So what we did uh, in 2011, we did a study to differentiate and come up with what is the best marker with a limited marker, with a resource limited setting, what we can do to differentiate these tumors. So we picked up a few urothelial markers like GATA3, S100P, CK5 by 6, P63, Uroplatin 2, 3, and some PSA, PSMA, and Rosaloceptor, NK3.1, and P501S for prostate. Uh, so, a few words about GATA3 for the uh, trainees. GATA3 is becoming fairly non specific nowadays, but it's good if breast and bladder are not in the differential. GATA3 can be positive in very, very rarely in prostate cancer, but it's a good marker for bladder. It's a T cell transcription factor. It stains all the autonomic nervous system tumors, including paraganglioma's, neuroblastomas, parathyroid tumors. And s 100 p do not use it now. We did it that time, but it's kind of a dirty stain. I won't spend a lot of time on it. It's a placental S100. Europlacin 2. In our experience, Europlacin 2 or 3 are good if the tumor looks like bladder. If the tumor doesn't look urothelial, then Europlacin 2 and 3 hardly helps. Prostin. Prostin is a great marker. Is positive across the patient grade pattern and metastatic state of prostate cancer. And NKX treatment, when I love this marker, is the prostatic. It is in the downstream pathway of androgen receptor. It's a nuclear marker. It stains prostatic epithelium testes and all the other structures, but it's a great marker when you are differentiating a bladder from prostate. PSMA, which is a membrane antigen, and ARG. ARG doesn't help much, but it can be positive in 40 to 80 percent of tumors. And in the high grade tumor, the positivity rate is low. So, if you see 
hundred percent of our cases are positive for GABA three in this case, and to see the result with Europlatin three is very very hopeless. Only twenty percent of the cases highlighted by Europlatin three, and two is also not great; is only seventy percent. Seven twenty. I'll come to the slide, and in prostate. NKH 3.1, P501 days, and PSMA, they are great markers. AR is not a great marker when you are differentiating bladder from prostate because few cases of bladder can be positive for androgen receptor. Again, PSA is hopeless, is one fourth of the cases. So, the upper panel is GATA3 positivity in urothelial carcinoma, and the lower panel is PCA, prostatic carcinoma, which is dead negative for GATA3. S100 P shows nuclear positivity with some cytoplasmic dirtiness, and it's negative in prostate, positive in bladder. UCA case CK56, CK56 and P63, they are positive in bladder. Again, the positivity rate is low because of high grade tumor. Just remember, P63 can be positive in atrophic variant, and a few of the rare non-atrophic variants of prostate cancer. But classically, by definition, fundamentally, they are P63 and CK556 negative. Uroplakin is a membrane stain with sometimes with a Golgi joint accentuation next to the nucleus. Just a few words about 7 and 20. About 20% 20 are prostate cancer in the literature. They are positive for 7 and 20 together, and about 40% are bladder. They're going to be 7 and 20 positive together. So 7 and 20 doesn't really help, but it is both positive. It favors more bladder than prostate. PSA, which you must be kind of staining in prostate, very not great kind of staining. And bladder it is negative. NKX is a nuclear stain, strong nuclear positivity, and P501S is a cytoplasmic stain with accentuation. PSMA membrane and AR is a nuclear stain. ARG, again, nuclear stain, it was positive only in only 35% of the cases. So we derived from this study, in, along with other studies, so I'm not going to go over all this. Your GATA and H100P are good markers for, I mean, or P63. I do not personally use it, though we did it that time for bladder. And in case, PSM and P501S for prostate. So, in a resource limited setting, not to waste antibodies, at least two of the each marker, which is highlighted in yellow, to determine the lineage. I'm not using the linear specific marker, the linear associated, because there is some amount of linear inf infidelity among this marker. And it all depends on the experience of the individual and how the laboratory is performing. Coming under the state case three, I'll take the questions at the end. Is a 64 year old women, man with a history of renal transplant? Is a post transplant guy and CT exam, so the five by three centimeter mass involving the left bladder wall and cystoscopy in the left bladder wall. So the hypertrophy without any specific mass, probably some kind of a, the mass, it was more like a hypertrophy of the left bladder wall with a smooth contoured elevation of five centimeter rather than a specific mass. And there was, it was non-pedunculated with erythema. A TURBT was formed. So this is what we have. We have this thin wall veins, the muscle, and they are, they are distributed. I would say they are a ground contour gland or cyst-like structures starting from the epithelium on the right side, uh, they are going to the left, they are infiltrating. So there is an infiltrative lesion with small tubules or gland to larger cyst-like structures and they are getting into the muscularis propria. These are the mucosy muscles with the thin muscles, these are the thicker work bottle, and th the thin muscles are kind of next to these veins in the lamina propria. Again, if you see here, they are a variable size and shape, some are elongated, some are oblong, and if you go to high part, they have a thick basement membrane, the cells are polyhedral, the nucleus is really enlarged, it has more or less, if you see, they look like school of fish. What I mean, they look alike, all these nuclei. The chromatin texture is also similar. They have a small nucleolus. They do not, I mean, the cell, the nuclear chromatin texture of the cells, they do not differ from each other. 
that is one thing to point and that is thick basin membrane if you if this cells they do so a little more a pical com compartment of the these cells have more eosinophilic cytoplasm and some cells are kind of trying to get out of the cell sort of a hobnailing so again what to do so i thought of probably i'm dealing with a prostatic adenocarcinoma a urothelial carcinoma with glandular differentiation clear cell carcinoma or a nephrogenic metaplasia versus adenoma given the history of renal transplant did some stain uh, to cover all the differentials it was positive for ck7 and 20 and positive for ck7 20 was negative i'll come to the next this slide again later and P63 was negative, PSA was negative, PSA negative, NK3.1 negative. So my data 3 was negative. So bladder and prostate are out. It was positive for human kidney injury molecule 1, CK7, PAX8, and ACE100A1, which is a marker for renal tubule, the entire nephron. So I can clearly know this why I'm dealing with a nephrogenic adenoma because this tumor has this lesion or this tumor like lesion has a derivation from the metanephron. So, the benign epithelial lesions of the urinary tract, which are characterized by tubules, gland, papillary lesions. Excuse me, just give me one second. Something happened. So, as you say, nephrogenic adenoma, I won't go over the entire slide. These are the, because of instrumentation, the cells they set out from the renal tubules and they come and harbor anywhere along the urothelial tract. And these are also proven by cytogenetic studies that derive from the renal tubule. They give a tubular glandular pattern if you're lucky, but it can be very, very fibromyxoid and pseudo infiltrative giving the appearance of all these differentials. And the nuclei can be very prominent and they show resonativity here. They can show papillary picture, they infiltrate the muscle, they have a lot of basophilic cytoplasm with mucin in the, and they sometimes look like squamous cells and thyroid like all these pictures. So the differentials are always three cancers, clear cell carcinoma of the bladder, adenocarcinoma of the prostate, and urothelial carcinoma with nested and glandular pattern. Give me one second, there is some issue with this animation thing. Okay, so I'll now I fixed it. So if I go back to this pattern, so what we really bothers the pathologist? If it is infiltrated and the cells are showing more than disorative ATPM. The cytoplasm is more clear, less eosinophilic, and the cells are hobnailed. Then you kind of think of, am I dealing with something erroneous? Uh, sometimes it looks like this. This is fairly straightforward. But if it's hobnailed and you have flat cells with smudgy nuclei, you're really worried what you are dealing with. So what are the subtle differences in morphology differentiating a nephrogenic adenoma from prostatic axillary adenocarcinoma? The overlapping features are they both so pseudo infiltrate. Nephrogenic adenoma is also infiltrative and prostatic is infiltrative. They both have prominent nucleolus. They both lack the basal cilia. They both are negative for P63 and CK556. And amicar or rest image is going to be positive in nephrogenic adenoma and prostatic axillary adenocarcinoma. What are the features which favor a prostatic cancer? It is a more homogeneous tumor cell population. They can have cribriform structures and a solid or cribriform pattern if involved in the bladder and cystic atrophic and the positive for the prostatic marker, which are negative in nephrogenic adenoma. Urothelial versus nephrogenic adenoma. Common features, they both can have tubular pattern, glandular architecture, mixoid stroma, infiltration, solid nest, but in situ component, a CIS would be negative no papillary component and deep invasion into the muscle are all present in urothelial carcinoma but trust me i have seen nephrogenic adenoma invading the deep muscle 
Inventory market will give the positive here and the negative in nephrogenic adenoma. You don't have to do all the steps. And among clear cell adenocarcinoma in a female with hobnailing, a lot of clearing, the problem comes with the clear cell adenocarcinoma of the bladder or coming from the GI tract. Tubular, tubular cystic, and solid nested pattern more in favor of nephrogenic adenoma. However, you can have the similar picture with ATPR in nephrogenic adenoma as clear cell carcinoma. So what you see in clear cell carcinoma, you see prominent nuclear pleomorphism. The school of fish appearance is lost. What I mean by school of fish, the ATPI is not repetitive. It is one cell look completely different from the neighbor. Or from two cells apart, the cells are looking different. They do not look like they are derived from the same lineage or from the same family. You see frequent mitotic activity, very high Ki67. They may be positive for P53 and CK20. But instead of going to the aminos, don't jump into the amino, you can have a morphology answer. So we kind of published this study a few years ago. So what we saw in nephrogenic adenoma, these are four cases, all the mimic. The left one is the nephrogenic adenoma. Top one is the clear cell adenocostum of the bladder. Bottom left is the bladder adeno, and bottom right is the prostatic acinar adenocostum. If I go by the renal tubular marker, S100, A1 is the renal tubule associated marker, it's positive in nephrogenic adenoma because it is derived from the renal tubule starting from the PCT from the Bowman capsule to the collecting duct is going to be positive everywhere and then dead negative in the other differentials. PAX2, again renal positive nuclear, the negative in the rest. PAX8, again can be positive in bladder adenosis. About 30% of bladder adenos can be PAX8 positive. So it's not a great stain if your differential is a nephrogenic adenoma versus a bladder adenoma. HKIM1 is a fairly good molecule. It was discovered recently in a research lab. It's a kidney injury. Normal kidney tubules do not express this kidney injury molecules. When the, <coughs> excuse me, when the tubules are injured by instrumentation or by nephritis, uh, like in chronic pyelonephritis and all, they try to express these human kidney injury molecules as compared to the normal and the atrophic tubule. It is positive in nephrogenic adenoma. That again, so it, it has a derivation from the injured tubular epithelial. That is negative from the rest of the differential. Amacar, amacar is a bad stain to differentiate. Do not waste your money using amacar. It's going to be positive in all the four differentials of all the three differentials of nephrogenic adenoma in variable degree. It's positive in TSL adeno, it's positive in conventional adeno and nested TC, uh, urethral carcinoma and nephrogenic adenoma. H100P again helps in differentiating UC and CCC is negative, it's a negative stain. But do not, we don't have to worry to do a negative stain if we're studying, so we did it, but you're good with renal tubular marker. KI67 is low. If I go to this slide, your KI system is extremely like 1% or almost nil in nephrogenic adenoma. And classically, just remember one thing prostate cancer, even if it is 5 plus 5 prostate, acinar adenocarcinoma, the KI is usually low as compared to much low as compared to the urothelial carcinoma. And prostate cancers classically do not show significant peritumoral or intertumoral dysmorphia. That is something to remember. And so if you're doing a KI-67 to say it is a prostatic cancer versus a non-cancer, you're wasting your time and antibody. And again, if a prostate cancer is kind of transforming to a small cell carcinoma, you see KI-67 like this must be. That's a different scenario. So this is just in a montage, kind of a global view. You have all the tumors and the staining pattern. And what I said, this is basically all the tools. And the S100 we use in the lab is a cocktail of all the 16 S100 molecules. And A1 is for kidney, and P is for placenta, and for bladder. So by saying this tumor is this lesion, a tumor-like lesion, I'm sorry, I'm repeatedly saying this tumor, the tumor-like lesion positive for renal tubule associated marker indicate this is derived from the injured renal tubule, and it is not urothelial carcinoma or clear cell or prostatic acne. So it's a benign tumor identity, which is associated with prior injury to the renal tubular epithelium, and the cells 
they kind of set out and they try to harbor anywhere along the urethral tract from the pelvic urethric junction to the penile urethra. And so, and they have a range of morphologic patterns. They try to kind of infiltrate. They do not form cap a capsule around them. And these are the markers to differentiate it from other lesions. Let's go to the next case. We'll go slowly. It's a 70 year old woman with a remote history of total abdominal hysterectomy and unilateral salping of One tube and ovary is out and the uterus is out. And it was most likely for a benign lesion, what the patient said, but we did not have any chart to review or the report to review the exact diagnosis. The patient here, the presenting complaint was a dull and progressively worsening lower abdominal pain, mostly in the pelvis followed by hematuria, and it was again a painful hematuria. This is the imaging. If you see here, you have the bladder, which is distended in the center, and it measured 15 centimeter in greatest dimension, with severe wall distension. Why I'm saying severe wall distension, you hardly see anything. It is kind of thickened. It's like a chink-like lumen. And with the trigone of the bladder is inseparable from the anterior wall of the thickened vagina. It's stuck to it. The pouch of Douglas is, sorry, the, the, the space, the peritoneum between the bladder and the vagina, they are kind of stuck. Concerning there is some invasion. And cystoscopy showed severe hemorrhagic cystitis with multiple hemorrhagic area, necrotic tissue, so the surgeon went ahead with the transurethral section. So what we receive in the transurethral section here, we saw a tumor with variable histology. It has cystic areas and solid nesting pattern. So the solid nesting pattern and cystic area infiltrating the bladder and musculature. So it was a, at least a PT2 lesion. It has invaded the musculature, the stage 2 lesion. With cystic areas and solid areas. And in the cystic area, some cysts are lined by atrophic tubules or atrophic cells, and some cells have volumes of cytoplasm with sort of hobnailing, where the nucleus is trying to get out of the cell, and some cells without hobnailing. Uh, but the clearing is prominent. So we thought what it could be. My first thought in this case was of bladder adenocostal. But why? And it's probably have infiltrated the bladder wall because it is infiltrating the muscle in the two RBD chips and invaded the vaginal epithelium. So it's a clear cell adenocostum in the bladder, looking at the histology. Uh, so these are the differential clear cell adenocostum of the urethelial tract or the GYN tract because the vagina is still there and the, one of the ovaries is there. So it could be a GYN tract, urethelial clear cell carcinoma or the clear cell carcinoma of the urethelial tract. Clear cell features in the conventional urethelial carcinoma, atypical nephrogenic adenoma, which was a far-fetched thought just for completion, high-grade serous carcinoma, clear cell features, renal cell, or a colorectal. There is a broad differential. Uh, because there was tethering to the um, rectal wall, the, the vagina is kind of effaced. So we thought of a colorectal carcinoma as well. So renal markers were done, Pax8 was positive, CK7 was positive, CK20 was positive, it was positive for one second. Amacar was positive, 20 was negative, uh, 20 and CDH2 were negative, 7 Amacar, HMW, CK and HNF, B1 and Pax8. HNF, B1 positive, so we are again puzzled. Are we doing with a clear cell adeno of the bladder or clear cell adeno of the GYN tract? Pax8 can be positive in both. So Pax2 and Pax8 doesn't really help differentiating clear cell from either tract, G1 tract or the G2 tract. CK7 can be positive in both. Amacar gives a little hint to our bladder and HMWCK also gives a little hint to our bladder. This tumor was negative for CK20, CDX2, so it's probably not colorectal. It was TTF1, WT1, all this negative. GATA3 was weakly positive. It was not good, but I considered in the beginning it was negative. Metastatic workup, including CD scan, bone scan, liver function tests were all negative. There's no evidence of metastatic disease. This is a resection specimen. We have the pelvic anterior exenteration specimen, if you see. There is the 
The tumor is kind of eclampsia. It is a 6.7 centimeter papillary mass in the inferior aspect of the posterior bladder wall. Involving the proximal urethra, extending through the detrusor muscle to the deep anterior vaginal wall. This kind of invading the deep anterior and vaginal, this entire area is involved, including the margin. So what is it? So in morphology, we have these four kinds of area. If you see on the top right, I'll start with a benign thing or a low grade thing. On the top right, it looks like nephrosonic adenoma, what we just saw a few slides ago. Vestibules, some hobnailing, uniformity, cystic area. And in the top left, you have glandular structures with a little variation in the nucleoside, but it looks like an adenocarcinoma in this part. At least I can say these are infiltrative glands with some sort of edema and mixoid change in the background. Some undulation is there, and nuclear enlargement is there. Definitely, these cells look bad and worse than these cells. And on the left, bottom left, it is a big structure lined by mucinous epithelium. That much I can see from this part. And the bottom right, it looks something which is getting into the perivesicular, from the outer half of the muscle to the perivesicular fat. Okay. Again, what are the interesting findings we got? If I go back to my first picture on the top, this is adenocarcinoma in situ. This is an in situ component. Why? There is, I did not see any grip reforming. I would say there is absolutely no desmoplasia. It looks just edematous and mixoidy with some fibroblast and inflammatory cells. So no desmoplasia, no breakdown, no necrosis. And this is a focus which is away from the main tumor. And it looks like an AIS, adenocarcinoma in situ. And the red left we know on the top right is nephrosonic adenoma. In the three, we have malignant glands appear to transition into focus of goblet cells. If I go to this one. What do you see here? This area, the mucin is preserved. If you see, the classical teaching we have from our PGI days, when the mucin is preserved, the cells have a lot of mucin. Probably we are not dealing with a neoplastic or a dysplastic process. Whereas the top half, you do not, you hardly see any mucin in the clearing of the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm is not visible rather. So this is the dysplastic change which is happening in the this big gland. So the top part looks dysplastic and the bottom part doesn't look dysplastic as normal. And here it is invading into the why I'm saying it is invading into because it's evoking a lot of stromal reaction. The cell is a very juicy stroma with a lot of cells inflammatory cells and fibroblasts, myofibroblasts, and the cell glands are clip reforming. Once you see clip reforming, clip reforming is not a pattern. It is actually an architectural structure to tell the cells are invaded. So, and seven out of 21 lymph nodes were involved by this process with hemorrhage and stroke. So what is it? So in summarizing what we did in the immunohistochemistry from all these cells, the nephrosonic adenoma behaved like a nephrosonic adenoma with positivity for Pax8 and all this thing. But the neoplastic cells were negative for CK20 and CDX2, so it is not colonic. They are positive for GATA3, they're positive for CK7, and they are positive for Resimage. And they have a very weak positivity for CA125. So and the intestinal like gland, which are non dysplastic, they were positive for CK20 and CDX2. So that is very important. The white part of the gland, this part of the gland, were positive for CDX2 and CK20. So the variable pathologies which are going on, these glands are negative for CDX2 and CK20. So what is it? And it was not in the dome of the bladder, it is in the lateral wall. So these are the CK7 positive structures and amateur positive neoplastic glands, which are negative for estrogen receptor, CK20 and C. And CDX220 were positive in the non-neoplastic or the uh, full subducent containing cells, and the cells are Pax8 negative. And this is the focus within the lymph node, which are positive for ERP, and the stroma was positive for CD10, and WT1 also positive. So the variable histology, we have an adenocarcinoma, we have some mucinous epithelium, we have without dysplasia, nephrosonic adenoma, and something which is happening, and the clear cell adenocarcinoma area, and something which is happening within the lymph node 
other than the adenopalsoma, so we do not know what is it. But the final diagnosis gave is a clear cell carcinoma of the lower urinary tract with areas of nephrogenic adenoma associated, adenocarcinoma in situ, intestinal metaplasia, and lymph node involvement by endosalpingiosis. I'm sorry, I said the CD10 negative, but the stroma was CD10 negative only the glands were ERPR positive and the positive for WG1 and PAX8. So that is the focus and the ciliated cells. So that is the focus of endosalpingiosis and the area with intestinal metaplasia and dysplasia, adenocarcinoma and nephrogenic adenoma. With the main actor, which is the clear cell carcinoma of the GYN tract, or not the GYN tract, from the urothelial tract. So take home message is presence of adenocarcinoma in situ and negative metastatic workup. Bladder primary is fibered over a metastasis. Classic architectural patterns that Amacar confirms the false diagnosis to be a clear cell adenocarcinoma over an urothelial carcinoma with clear cell carcinoma feature. Severe ATPR mitosis, high KI67 and P53 positivity argues against nephrogenic adenoma in those areas where Amacar can be positive in nephrogenic. Again, absence of endometrial stromal proliferation, just ciliated cells. And what actually helped us in those cells, they have some cilia and they're negative for CD10. They're only positive for ERPR and PAX8 that argues against the endometriotic rather we say it is an endosalpingiosis. I'll go to that slide again. The cells, now hypothesis is visible but not here, but they are like this gland. This is a neoplastic gland. There are some glands which are admixed, which are glands of endosalpingiosis. So, can I take a few more minutes or I have to stop here? No, 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 please go ahead. There is enough time. Yeah, you enough can time. Okay. okay, can I take like a half a minute break to grab some water and come back? <laughs> yeah, please, please, please. please. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I'm back. Am I audible, Dr. Nadim? Absolutely audible, clear. Okay, Perfectly. cool, cool, cool. Great. Okay. So for this case five and six, uh, I thought like I will club these two guys together because they have similar history and essentially the morphologic features are pretty much similar with a little variation. So they both presented with thad nodular prostate, high PSA and 12 core biopsies of uh, this is for the case one. What you see here, all the cores were involved, and the involvement, the extent of involvement was high. And we have this cribriform structures. You can see here, they look like cribriform structures. They have holes with a solid. And what in the cribriform, another good thing here is they have a circumscribed 
dribble from structure. They look, they have a pushing margin. They are not infiltrating in the stroma. Here, basically, it is a biopsy artifact, but it has a clear interface with the stroma and hardly any desmoplastic reaction. These are normal endothelial cells. These are normal smooth muscle cells from collagen, but it has a very smooth interface with some clefting probably, and it is cribriform. We have holes within those structures. And this is what our cribriform is called. And just remember, when a tumor cell is probably cribriforming, it is not the residual space. These are the new spaces formed by the tumor cell. And here, there's some necrosis, and some calcium is there. It's trying to make calcific mounds, but some necrosis. A mitosis is there. Uh, cells are kind of monomorphic. Some pleomorphism is here, some spindling, but probably I dragged the slide. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, there's some spindling is also there. So again, in other areas, what we see, the central areas look like lymphocytes with this gland-like structure, so the acinyl-like structure in the center, and the periphery it is more regimented, and they are more elongated. I, I would say it kind of reminiscent of a small cell-like features, because I do see a concavity of one cell is fixing into the convexity. Maybe I'm imagining a lot here, like a little, um, the concavity of this is fitting into the convexity of this. So it's our adjuperous effect, or not the phenomena. Phenomena is the necrosis. It is the adjuperous effect of nuclear molding. Okay, and there's some gland. Yeah, two types of cells: hypochromatic and vesicular. And here, some necrosis, cell dropout, mitotic activity, cells to the periphery look little smudgy. And but what what you can see, and the cell towards the most periphery, they're like spindle. Here. I, kind of look like two cell, but here it could be a fibroblast or it could be a basal cell. I don't know. In the second case, we do have this kind of cells. You can see here, it looks like really ugly. We have the cells towards the periphery. They're round, innocent. They are like making a line with clear cytoplasm. And the cells at the top of it, they're humongous, the big, huge cells. And they have intranuclear vacillations. They are of variable size and cells, nuclei, and the bad. So what is it? And this area, it looks like a ductal carcinoma in situ, if I think about breast. It's a comito or a comito, or should not be used in histology, it's a gross terminology. So it has a necrosis in the center, early necrosis, and a lot of cribriforming. This is another area. Again, I'm kind of emphasizing no dysmorphia, and the cell has a very smooth contour. The nucleus. I mean, the the structure has a, the cribriform structure. I would use this as cribriform structures with smooth contour, eosinophilic cytoplasm. And at this far, if I go to the cells, the cells are not really elongated. They're looking elongated somewhere focally, but mostly they're polyhedral to polygonal to round or the cube order with cytoplasm. So their incidence ratio is not like very tremendously high. They have some cytoplasm. It's like Good amount of cytoplasm is there. So how to proceed? We so at this juncture, I did not think about a cribriform pattern bit because my volume of tumor I'm dealing with in these two cases involving all the 12 cores and in about 60, 70, 80 percent extent. So I'm not dealing with an inside to process. I thought I mean it's not a high grade prostatic intraepithelial neoplasia, though it has features of prostatic equilibrium pattern. I did not find any area typical of a solid island of prostatic acinal adenocarcinoma or small infiltrative glands going in between the benign non-adjacent glands or the benign glands that are going in between that. That kind of focus. Everything what I showed you, I got those focused maximally. So my thought was whether I'm dealing with a equilibrium pattern for prostatic acinal adenocarcinoma or it is a prostatic ductal carcinoma with a cribriform pattern which I kind of ruled out because the cells are not elongated, the cells are not dark enough, they have prominent nucleoli and it looks more acinar in derivation than ductal in derivation because the nucleoli are prominent, the cells are polyhedral to polygonal, the outline is non-infiltrative which is more smooth contour and 
the PSA in this case was very high. Typically in ductal adenocarcinoma, just to tell you, the PSA may not be that high as prostatic axillary adenocarcinoma because the ductal cells do not produce PSA. It is the axillary cell which produces PSA. Ductal are the carcinoma, the verumentanum, or they arise from the prostatic cuticle and prostatic duct in the center. So in that area, so they are not PSA positive typically. So I did a pin four cocktail, which I, I have three things. We have amacar or the resimage, a nuclear stain to highlight the basal cell, which is a P63, and a cytoplasmic stain or a membrane stain for my basal cells, which are CK903 or high molecular cytoplasmic. See here, even if you see one or two basal cells in this cribriform structure with smooth contour, non desmoplastic stroma, it is not a prostatic acinar adenocarcinoma cryptoform pattern. Oh, my basal cell is maintained. But the cells are neoplastic. The cells are neoplastic because non-neoplastic prostatic epithelium traditionally do not express resumes. Why I'm saying traditionally? Because in injured cases, atrophic, post-related setting, even normal glands do show some resumes, wishy-washy kind of positivity. So I said traditionally, when you see so much of resumes positivity, the red color resumes positivity in the in for cocktail, you stay away from calling something as non neoplastic or non cancerous. So, I'm dealing with a cancer. I do not know what kind of cancer it is, but it's a cancer where the basal cell is retained. This is another one basal cell cytoplasmic membrane staining, CK903. Here is also mentioned throughout. So, my differential diagnosis here is am I dealing with a high grade state or I'm dealing with or uh, IDCP. IDCP is intraductal carcinoma of the prostate gland. So what is intraductal carcinoma? I finally signed it out as an intraductal carcinoma of the prostate gland. What is the eyes to your ear? There's a lot of noise coming in. Please keep your uh, audio off, please. Yeah, I think uh, someone has the audio on or something. So for that reason, a noise is coming. Okay. So what the fundamental difference between an introductal carcinoma versus the lesion pattern four is the absence of basal cell layer. But I have a table to show you how normally we should differentiate. What is an introductal carcinoma? We have introductal carcinoma of the prostate and introductal carcinoma of the breast. I, I do both breast and prostate, and they both have analogous organ. One has a TDLU, and other has a PDLU, prostatic duct axonal unit, a lobular unit. So what do you see? In introductal carcinoma of the breast, it is a precursor lesion, or it is something which is, a, which is going to give rise to an invasive component. It is less erroneous than an invasive, whereas introductal carcinoma of prostate is a pattern of introductal spread of a ductal or acinar adenocarcinoma. It is one way, I need mean, one way it is kind of ahead of the game. Uh, some uh, devastation has already, the two, I mean, it is a high grade lesion. It is not a lower grade lesion than, it is not a precursor of, what I mean to say, it is not a precursor of acinar adenocarcinoma. It is a pattern of spread of acinar adenocarcinoma through the duct. So, and this so dense or solid cribriform pattern and there is a clean interface or smooth contoured circumscribed interface between the stroma and the cribriform structure. If there are loose cribriform, when you cannot outline the cells or micropapillary, the nuclear size is typically six times that of the normal and presence of necrosis. Basically, the layer is preserved. Pin versus introductal carcinoma of the prostate. Suppose the volume is little low. In this case, it's like a no-brainer, a lot of tumor. If you have atypical glands surrounded by basal cell and where you are really struggling to call it the high grade prostatic intraepithelial neoplasia versus introductal cosmo of the prostate, you talk to the urologist and ask for a repeat biopsy, probably an unsampled thing has to be come out. In a case where you're getting only introductal carcinoma of the prostate without acinar component, please talk to your urologist and write down in your comment. You have introductal component, carcinoma component in the prostate in all the codes amounting to this percentage and extent or whatever, blah, blah. However, we did not see any acinar component in this biopsy study. Therefore, a reassessment and biopsy 
has to be done or is recommended to get the unsampled thing out because they are invariably associated with unsampled acinar adenocarcinoma. It all depends on volume and how widespread the involvement is. So there's an article in 2015 differentiating high grade print from introductory people really do not use it in day to day practice. Uh, P10 and ARC. Tamara has published this and when she published it was a fellow, I mean, it's a great thing, but nobody really used it. It was a great thing in research, but not in the day to day life. And loss of P10 is usually um, kind of not seen in high grade prostatic intracular neoplasia, but uh, you have a loss of tumor suppression when it gets into cancer. IDCP versus infiltrating carcinoma. This is what? This is a benign duct, and this is all pure tumor. Again, let's focus on this. If you see this one, this, the little one in the center, you have thin spindle cells in the periphery, and it has a smooth contour. This probably has a smooth contour, but if you get into this one, this one, here the contour is kind of merging with the periphery with some amount of dysmoplasia. It is angulated. There is no angulation in this one and this one, but this, this, these two are angulated. So how they are doing with pin four cocktail? See here. This center one, which has a smooth contour, is IDCP, which is a very important architectural feature to differentiate IDCP from lesion pattern 4 adenocarcinoma and the rest of the things where the lesion pattern 4 adenocarcinoma because they have to be forming with loss of Dr. Mahanti, the pointer is not getting visible from the background. Okay, okay, sure. So like this one, if I see, this is, is it visible now? The pointer? I can actually use that arrow option so sorry let me use that point option one point so if i kind of try to draw a smooth circle kind of thing i can easily draw surrounding this structure however if i try with this one let's try with this one it has Yeah, suppose I go with this one. This is kind of merging here with some angulation. This one is also, it, uh, it is merging. So this little one here, it is an infolding. So once you see non-smooth contoured surface, you suspect probably we're dealing with something which is not an ID speed of the cribriform pattern pole. So that is what happening here. The central gland with the brown staining for Basal cell, it is IDCP, it is an IDCP, and the rest are cribriform pattern 4. Again, focus here on this big gland with a smooth contour and small one like this one. Here, if I kind of draw, just surrounding the arrow area, this area, the entire area. Here, what is happening? This is a focus of lesion three plus four. These are three glands here. This one and this one. This is the three gland. This is the three gland with some stroma, and this is the cribriform four, cribriform four. Why I'm saying these are small infiltrative glands, and they do not have a smooth contour surface. And this one, see here, these glands are all positive for amacar without any brown staining. On the left, it has brown staining, this is IDCP, on the right it is IDCP and these are all pattern 3 and 4 asner adenocarcinoma. Same thing happening here, if you see. Here you can clearly see the basal cells. So it is all IDCP. In this case, how this case is doing, let's see. Basal cell present IDCP. So when do we do IHC for basal cells on IDCP? Do the basal cells when it could make a difference in 
if the infiltrative cancer i did if the volume is low if the volume is high then probably you may not do it in do the basal stain if it could possibly make a difference in the grade it's not usually required in this kind of scenario it is not required i did it for academic purpose but it's not required intraductal carcinoma of the prostate versus intraductal spread of a urothelial carcinoma because a urothelial carcinoma of the prostate urethra can get into the prostate so if you see this one what you have you have the cells even towards the periphery that polyhedron the vesicular nucleus and small nucleolus and you do the high molecular cytokeratin is positive in the periphery so you are again between an idcp or it is an intraductal spread of an urothelial carcinoma how about this one there is central necrosis a comedian or a plug is there in the center and is again positive for CK5 by 6. It was positive high molecular cytokeratin, CK903 and CK5 by 6. We sanded the intraductal carcinoma. Why? We had a history, and if you see clearly, morphologically, some times there is a very different morphology. Why? We had a history, and if you see clearly, morphologically, some times there is a very different morphology. Why? We had a history, and if you see clearly, some times there is a very different morphology. Why? We had a history, and if you see clearly, some times there is a very different morphology. Why? We had a history, and if you see clearly, some times there is a very different morphology. Why? We had a history, and if you see clearly, some times there is a very different morphology. Why? We had a history, and if you see clearly, some times there is a very different morphology. Why? We had a history, and if you see clearly, some times there is a very different morphology. Why? We had a history, and if you see clearly, some times there is a very different morphology. Why? We had a history, and if you see clearly, some times there is a very different morphology. Why? We had a history, and if you see clearly, some times you do see intra cytoplasmic vacuole and mitotic activity there are mitosis here like we have mitosis here the nuclear size and shape variation is there with regular nuclear margin and envelopes the nuclear envelope is kind of very irregular here and prominent chromocenters and prominent nucleoli these are some prominent chromocenters here and the nucleoli are very conspicuous and prominent which you see also in idcp but here the degree of pleomorphism is more as compared to idcp again if you see clearing squamoid differentiation lot of necrosis this is the prostatic duct which looks kind of benign and this is plugged in by a nest of urothelial carcinoma squamous differentiation differentiation will make it easy remember squamous differentiation can be seen in a post irradiated prostate or a prostate which has undergone therapy suppose before doing any sort of surgery or biopsy they have given the patient adt androgen deprivation therapy that produces a lot of squamous metaplasia of the prostatic urethra so you end up calling something as urothelial carcinoma if you do marker for squamous marker they are all going to be positive benign squamous cell malignant malignant squamous cell so in a post adt setting androgen deprivation setting very careful of calling something as benign and malignant if you are looking seeing only squamous cells the hmwck positive they are this is the typical hmwck positivity pattern of an idcp just peripheral pattern in cancer and a urothelial carcinoma involving the prostatic duct it is all over the place because everything is urothelial and they are going to be positive for high molecular cytokeratin because the acinar cells which are present in the center they are negative for high molecular cytokeratin gata three again positive for bladder is going to be negative for prostate significance of idcp only or idcp with low grade prostate cancer suppose you have a low grade tumor or only idcp what to do there was a study by dr goa and dr epstein uh, almost like 15 years ago um I have actually lucky to see these slides. I was rotating with him during my second year of residency. Uh, what are the introductory features, histologic features, and clinical significance of the finding? What they did, they took six radical prostatectomy specimens with high-grade infiltrating acinar adenocarcinoma with lesion pattern eight or nine. No extraprostatic extension or very focal extraprostatic extension was seen in five out of those six cases. Three of the sixteen who did not undergo radical prostatectomy developed bone metastasis. So this is the baseline clinical demographic data. So in this study, what this so the the studies prior to this, the IDCP represent an advanced stage of tumor product progression or intraductal spread. So considering this, we should treat the patient aggressively or should not treat the patient aggressively. The, the consensus now is the treatment the patient should be aggressively treated because this is not a precursor this is a progression pattern of acinar adenocarcinoma then brian and dr epstein 
uh, they did another study without invasive carcinoma, emphasizing on radical prostatectomy in general of urology. So what they found in the follow-up in 66 patients, of the 21 patients with radical prostatectomy, they reviewed the slide and they looked for both IDCP and invasive carcinoma. There are cases where the tumor has already progressed, but visible acinal carcinoma is seen in only 10% of the cases. So that means with IDCP, they have progressed. So the definitive therapy is recommended in the main with IDCP and little core biopsy, even in the absence of pathologically documented invasive prostate cancer. This is another case with again descriptive form structures, some angulations, smooth, some smooth contour. This is fairly smooth contour, self retaining monotony. The cells are not pleomorphic here. I know like the kids, they use the word pleomorphic nowadays a lot. They're not pleomorphic. They look, they are uniformly enlarged. They have a prominent nuclei, but they are big, uniformly big. Again, necrosis, but the basal cell layer is maintained. What you see from here, the surface, the is epithelial and the mesenchymal junction, the interface is non-infiltrative, non-desmoplastic. Oh, this is nothing for this one. So, not this one also, I'll skip. So, the distinctive morphologic pattern versus the high-grade pain, it is usually associated with, uh, almost invariably associated with high-grade cancer and poor pathology at radical prostatectomy and relatively poor prognosis the other threat. In most cases, it's an advanced stage of tumor progression with introductory spread of the tumor and rarely it shows an inside to process like breast. Justified to treat the patient's interrupted component and biopsy even in the absence of documented invasive or infiltrating prostate cancer. Grading, it is hard to tell if IDC are infiltrating cancer in many cases without stain. So do not grade it. Recommend to treat it as high-grade infiltrating cancer. So why not just call it a high-grade prostate cancer instead of trying hard to give it a semantics. In other organs, like in breast, we do not grade. So here you just said it's high grade. Uncommonly, only IDC or IDCP may be present in radical prostatectomy. So grading the biopsy as high grade gives wrong prognostic information. Current recommendation is to do basal cells if no obvious infiltrative. If there is a case with only IDCP, no infiltrating, obvious infiltrating cancer is seen, then please go for basal cells. What are the differences between cryptiform pattern 4 and IDCP? Most important thing is you have a rounded and circumscribed pushing interface with the stroma in IDCP, whereas irregular infiltrative acini present in pattern for cribriform. Let's stick to the morphology first. No desmoplasia in IDCP. Some desmoplasia can be seen in infiltrative pattern four. You have the acini are larger than the normal acini, but they do not so the branching within, they rather have a branching outside, IDCP branch, so a lot of convolution branching inside, not outside. Basal cells are absent, your basal cells are intact. How to differentiate ductal adenocarcinoma from IDCP? Ductal adenocarcinoma looks like an endometrioid adenocarcinoma of the uterus, the dual G1 tract, and they have piriform slit like structures, and the cells are long, pencil cell cells, papillary front. In both the cases, you have the basal cell retained. This was a lot of pseudostratification, papillary front, Whereas IDCP hardly saw any papilla formation. They do have a micropapilla without a fibrovascular core where the length of the papilla is about four to five times that of the width and the cells are cuboidal. So this is just to complete today's talk. You have something which looks like a GYN tract tumor with elongated stratified tumor cells, multilayering of the tumor cells. And you hardly see any cytoplasm. Rather, you see a lot of nuclear balls occupying the space is a ball of nuclear, the mound, or a cluster of nuclei the occupying the space with little intervening cytoplasm. You cannot say where the cell starts and where the cell ends, and they are stratified. This is what. And they have papilla formation, like a fibrovascular core or a vascular core with little fibrous tissue, and cribriform structures. It's kind of different, different from IDCP. Thank you. I can take a few questions now. Uh, we have a question. We have a we have a uh, chat comment from Dr. Bala from PGI Chandigarh. Yeah. He Bala, says, dear, uh, yeah, Dala, that's right, Bala uh, Morugan. He yeah. says, dear sir, we recently had biopsy from hepatic SOL in a known case of metastatic SNR carcinoma post ADT. The morphology was small islands 
with squamoid morphology p40 mm. and gata3 was diffusely positive and psa negative if we reviewed the previous biopsy which showed 3 plus 4 pattern how do we categorize yes that's a great question and i had a case i was completely screwed before signing out i was almost in the verge of signing that case out but god saved me so what happened if you have a post edit setting case you do not have any clue and no history and you looked at the biopsy it looks like as everything is squamous sometimes they look even ugly so you thought probably the first pathologist has misdiagnosed this case as prostate Uh, it's a prostate bladder cancer because gata3 is known to be positive in squamous epithelium so gata3 positivity p40 p63 ck5 556 all this positivity can see in the metaplastic squamous epithelium following post adt even at the metastatic site suppose you have a nodal metastasis the patient has received and and was in deprivation either as a drug or by gastritic the testicle so in that case what you see they saw extensive squamous metaplasia and they are known to show atypical squamous metaplastic change immunostain doesn't help here if you do nkx my case helped me because nkx 3.1 was positive in those cells so those are basic there are some cells which are nkx 3.1 positive that means there are residual prostate cancer cells which are kind of hidden by extensive metaplastic squamous cells which looks atypical they even look more atypical than the prostate cancer cells because the prostate cancer cells are more monotonous even at the metastatic site so be careful do not waste your money on doing any squamous marker in this case i request you even do not do gata 3 ck7 ck20 no nothing just if you are really kind of want to be sure do a nkx 3.1 and close your report does it help bala Dr. Bala, you can ask directly. You can just, uh, you know, switch your microphone on and ask Dr. Mohanty straight away. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Yeah, this is a great, great question. I appreciate. Yes, sir. Anybody you, sir. who wants to ask any other question can put their microphone on and ask a question. Dr. Mohanty is still online. so i think uh, there are none so uh, thank you dr mahanti for this extraordinary wonderful amazing lecture uh, i uh, we have not had enough of you so we would request you to take one more class maybe sometime on the 19th of august yeah i had a uh, couple of good cases in testicular tumor renal and penile cancers so i i would love to take a uh, one or two cases excellent so we, we we would like to have you on the 19th at 7:30 again yeah this time i promise i'm going to be careful i'll have my computer ready by 7:00 that's perfectly all right that's perfectly all right and for all the people who are there right still with us uh, i would like to thank everybody who are here and the people who have joined on the youtube and we have uh, people from the from uh, far east also who have joined in thank you very much for joining and before i close let me tell you that on the 26th and 28th of august we'll be having dr uh, <coughs> raja guru from uh, kuwait he'll be talking on hepatic lesions i wow. hope everybody joins then that be wonderful yeah. and we still continue to have our normal europath classes as usual we'll be announcing mm. them as also thank yeah. you so much everybody thank you dr mahanti once again pleasure to be with you thank you so much Thank you thank you everyone yeah good night